Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Bassam Haddad. I am uh, the founding uh, director of the Middle East and Islamic Studies program at George Mason University and uh, an associate professor at the Shar School, also at George Mason. And I am thrilled to be here to address one of the uh, important moments of the day that is taking place uh, in Iran. And we are more than thrilled, uh, actually, to have with us an array of remarkable uh, scholars who will address this matter uh, under the title of In Her Name, Women Rising, State Violence, and the Future of Iran. Uh, I have with me my uh, fantastic uh, uh, co-host, uh, Negar Razavi, whom I'll introduce in just a minute. But let me first say that this event is co-sponsored by the Shar School, the Middle East and Islamic Studies Program, the Arab Studies Institute, and the Abu Sulaiman Center for Global Islamic Studies, all at George Mason University. Um, and I am uh, looking forward to this discussion. I will not say very much because I know that many of you are looking to uh, hear from our speakers. I will introduce them because we do have an array of uh, five speakers uh, that I will uh, share their very brief bio with you. First, let me uh, say hi, Nigar. So Nigar, my uh, co-host and co-moderator, um, Nigar Lazavi is a public hu humanities research associate at the Kaplan Institute at Northwestern. Her work focuses on the international on the intersections of security, expertise, gender, humanitarianism, and the U.S. policies toward the Middle East. Uh, we will also be uh, speaking, of course, uh, or hearing from all of our uh, guests, and uh, they are Arzu Osanlu. Please feel free to uh, correct my uh, pronunciation. Um, Arzu is professor in the Department of Law, Societies and Justice, and the director of the Middle East Center at the University of Washington. Her work examines the formations of women's rights and human rights in cultural contexts and draws on ethnographic fieldwork in Iran. Her first book was entitled The Politics of Women's Rights in Iran. Hi, Arzu. Uh, next, we have Catherine Zahra Sameh. Uh, is an associate professor of gender and sexuality studies at UC Irvine. Her book, Axis of Hope, Iranian Women's Rights Activism, uh, Iranian Women's Rights Activism Across Borders, situate Iranian women's rights activism within the longstanding tension between Iran and the United States. Um, hello, Catherine. Uh, next, uh, we have uh, Fulur uh, Farhang. Please also correct my spe my pronunciation. Uh, she is an advanced doctoral candidate in anthropology at Northwestern University. Her research examines war and conflict, displacement and mobility and borderland in the Middle East. Hi, Fulur. Uh, Next is uh, Mani, our own uh, Naj Na Manije Nasrabadi is a scholar and founding member of the Raha Iranian Feminist Collective and also a co-editor of the Iran page on Jadaliya. Hi, Manije. It's good to see yeah, you. It's good to see you all. To see you. It's just that I know you a little bit, a little bit more. Um, and then finally, uh, we have Nahid Siamdust, whom we've had uh, on our uh, various events in the past. Uh, Nahid is Assistant Professor of Middle Eastern Studies at UT Austin. She examines issues of uh, transnational cultural production, politics, media in and beyond Iran. Her book, Soundtrack of the Revolution, examined the power of music and cultural production more broadly in Iran in creating political alignments and forms of dissent within the country's political sphere. Hi, Nahid, how are you? Welcome back. Uh, and uh, let me uh, now move to uh, giving the floor to my uh, co-moderator, Negar, who will be uh, initiating the conversation. Welcome all. We will be here for about 90 minutes. And I am uh, not sure if we will be able to have a Q&A later on because of the uh, length of this event, but we will sort of play this by ear. Uh, Negar, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Bassam, and thank you uh, to our speakers and to everybody who's tuning in right now, uh, wherever you are. Um, this is really a timely event. Um, and I just want to, before I jump into the questions, mention that we're not going to go into um, sort of the basics of what have happened over the past two weeks. Uh, we are going to um, dive into some of the context and to uh, put what is happening right now in 
a broader historical, cultural, legal, and even global context. Um, but if you are looking for sort of a very brief um, description of what's happening, uh, Nahid um, did a wonderful five minute interview on NPR that I would uh, highly recommend if you just wanna understand sort of the basic facts of what um, is going on right now in Iran and why people are out on the streets. Um, so with that, I want to turn to our first question, which is that Iranian women have been organizing and demanding rights for well over a century in very meaningful and powerful ways. Uh, the very first uh, mass scale protest after the establishment of the Islamic Republic uh, was the Women's March Against Compulsory Hijab. Iranian women were on the front lines of the student protests in the 90s, uh, again in 2009 um, with what was called the Green Movement. And since then, they've been very active in various ways. Um, and we'll get into some of that history during this uh, discussion. So my first question um, for our speakers is, what's different or unique about the protest this time? Um, and I won't direct it to a specific person. So uh, if you wanna, whoever wants to take up that first question, go ahead. I can I can take that on, unless Furu, would you like to go first? Go for it. Okay, this is just sort of my bit and I'm sure we can all sort of contribute to what is different this time. But I think what is different this time, we've seen sort of this arc over the last, you know, five years or so where hopes for reform really have come to a dead end within the Islamic Republic in part because of the greater sort of, you know, engineering of the elections. And of course, this is on the heels of um, a pandemic, years of uh, severe economic sanctions by the US. So generally, this is coming at a time when people have been doing very badly economically, socially, politically, politically. there've been greater repressions. And of course, with the election of Raisi, um, you know, there have been now weeks since July of a, a much more sort of, you know, increased uh, presence of the morality police. And we've seen videos of uh, state violence against women uh, re-mediated uh, on social media. And this is something that uh, women have been seeing and people have been seeing over the course of the last month or two. Um, and of course, uh, also the the whole incident, I think, with Sepide Rashno was really important that sort of scuffle that happened on the bus um, and the state media's presentation of Sabida on state media to sort of apologize to the Chaudhuri woman whom she whom she had um, apparently attacked. And I think it's sort of, you know, the culmination of years, but also sort of this pressurized sort of two months of uh, humiliation and, uh, and greater repression against um, women and um, so what's different, I think, is all of these elements coming together. And of course, uh, Mahsa Amini, uh, the 22 year old who was killed being of uh, Kurdish uh, ethnicity. I think that really mattered because the slogan Jenjian Azadi has been existing within the Kurdish realm for several years now. Um, and so the fact that sort of, you know, that could unite people across Iran, not just on gender issues, but on sort of overarching issues and connect these different provinces and ethnicities um, has also um, contributed to the, um, to this moment. I can take it from here because I can just add a few other historical moments that I think mattered in the way that made this um, specific, uh, um, protest uh, unique and I think like like going about what Negar and uh, Nahid are talking about in terms of historical significance and the historical part being highlighted in the significances of these events I think we can read uh, this uh, new wave of Iranian uh, uh, women's movement towards liberation basically and, and I don't want to call it freedom for for, for for reasons that I hope we will get to uh, is to read it within two different contexts one would be the Iranian libera uh, women's liberation, liberation movement, not only in the last four decades, but actually going back to the 1905 uh, constitutional revolution, Mashrute. And from there, taking it through all these uh, basically years and decades of, uh, of struggle that are not necessarily against the Islamic rule, but it's much bigger and it's about patriarchal rule. And I think this is one of the things that connects the movement very clearly to um, a more international anti-establishment patriarch like anti-patriarchal movement that we, we, we will be most probably talking about later on. And one other thing is going back to Nahid's point about uh, the last, uh, specifically the last five decades of socioeconomic struggle that has been highlighted in, in different ways. And I think, again, going back to Mahsa, I mean, his figure, 
uh, the very unfortunate events and the journey she went through, but also galvanizing this event in a way that it kind of connects Saqqas, a town in the borderland of Kurdistan with, uh, with uh, uh, Iraq, uh, and bringing together not only generations of women who have been going through this uh, same, like I mean different, but also like very similar issues, and at the same time bringing in generations of men from different ethnic minorities, really like also self-identified religious and non-religious groups of people. Um, and also uh, connecting into uh, um, students um, in, uh, organizations that have been going on forever, but also the last five years, connecting to the labor uh, unions, teachers, syndic uh, bus driver syndicates, teachers, and also um, factory workers unions. And I think these are very important connections to make to understand how this is unique because basically Mahsa Amini became this thread that connected not only women, generations of women, but also all these other people who have been part of this struggle throughout. But now they found this moment to be under the banner of Jane Jian Azadi or uh, from Kurdish being translated to Farsi. And then now, to uh, the English of uh, woman, free, uh, woman life freedom and kind of bringing everyone together. So I think what's unique about it is that it was generalizable to bring in uh, kind of like an all encompassing uh, segments of Iranian society together. Yeah, I would like to just speak to some of that. And I agree with um, Furur and Nahid. And um, there's also some attention to be made to this idea that there isn't a call for Khatami to come out and represent or Mir Hossein Musavi. So some people are calling this leaderless, some people are calling it spontaneous. But what I think is really important is that there's um, a very straightforward attention to the issues related to women. And historically, going all the way back, as Furuk says, to the 1905 revolution, we have seen women's issues being uh, oftentimes used as a spark to gain their their um, their uh, ability, you know, their, to join in. But at the same time, their issues have been sidelined. First, let's get the revolution. Then we'll deal with women's issues. And what's happening here, because of the coalescing, as as Furu mentioned, of so many different issues around this lightning rod uh, event, is that there there is a very important stress and attention on the compulsory aspect of women's bodily comportment, the, the need for autonomy, um, and that is maintained and it is center stage. And I think that's very important. And the other, just the last thing about this is that um, I do research in Iran, I go every year, and I was there in 19, uh, in 2000 with the student protests and the closing of the newspapers. And one thing that was really striking to me this time, as opposed to that time, was a journalist friend was covering the events, and um, he interviewed, I, I mean, he was, he was recounting to me an event that he witnessed during the protest where a woman was screaming and, and pulling at her hijab and saying, in 20 years, this was 20 years ago, this is all you've given us. And he, ca he came to my house and he told me he, he witnessed this and he said, but you know, people aren't willing to die for this. And now 20 years later, this is ex exactly what's happening. And so we have to go back to the question, what's changed? And I think the, some of the things that Nahid said about the, the economic strains, Furu mentioned the maximum pressure and the sanctions have really come together to coalesce around this really big event, but it also has many vectors that contribute to it. Um, yeah, if I can jump in, I think, um, you know, I, I've been talking to a, a lot of different Iranians, you know, in diaspora in Iran, and there's a million different points of view and opinions, but I hear so many people saying, I have dreamed of this. I have been waiting my whole life for this, you know? And so I think we have to really um, underscore the fact that, you know, this is a, a far more radical movement, wave of protest uprising than what we've seen in the past. And, you know, that this is a, um, a unified determination that a government that harasses and arrests 
and tortures and kills women for so-called improper hijab must go. So absolutely people are at the place, as, as many of you said, where reform is, does not seem viable or even desirable, right? The demand is for an end to the Islamic Republic form of government, an end to theocracy. Um, and I think that is massively significant, right? That the, that the issue of patriarchy, patriarchal authoritarianism, patriarchal state violence um, has been at the center of this um, and has been the point of unity, as, as folks said, that can bring all the other issues all the, all the pressure and frustration with all of the other issues um, to the breaking point. Um, and you know, I also think that it, it brings together the issue of persecution of women and persecution of ethnic and religious minorities, right? Because um, of course, um, Gina Amini was Kurdish. And so this is a moment where I think there's an outpouring of multiple grievances, right? Against this government, but the fact that it's crystallized around the issue of women's bodily autonomy and equality is so important for the reasons Arazu and others said, because that issue again and again was deemed secondary, right? It was, you know, was always to, to be postponed and deferred. Um, so I think it opens up really tremendous possibilities for thinking about what, um, you know, what a feminist um, alternative, right, might look like. Um, in Iran and the fact that that's even on the table because you know in the 2009 green uprising which mobilized many of us you know in solidarity at that time you know it was a struggle for Iranian feminists in Iran to make these issues legible at that time you know i i remember some friends tried to go with signs and try to bring the issue of you know women's equality into that moment and nobody wanted to hear about it it just was not there was it wasn't resonating right so so that to me is just a phenomenal shift. Um, I'm really echoing what everybody else said, but but um, yeah. Gosh, I mean, I, I don't know that I have anything more to add. I, I, I feel like every point has been wonderful. I think we'll get into this in the course of the discussion, but I think one, one of the things that's so important is, is, is the question of bodies in space in a new kind of way. And this is, you know, the, the kind of bodily conscription that the state requires of everyone in every society, you know, in, in different kinds of ways. And I think we have, some of us, I'll, I'll include myself, have been hesitant to, to focus too much on the body because the body is so overdetermined and particularly in Iran, women's bodies and, you know, hijab has been overdetermined in some quarters. But to think about what this represents as a kind of, um, uh, you know, how our bodies unruly in protest, dissenting in different kinds of ways. And we can connect this also to all of the things that have been going on, right? The, the pensioners protests in July around inflation and the fact that, you know, they're saying our, our tables are empty, right? So the, the, body in, the body in need, the body under siege in all of these different ways, the body demanding um, new kinds of, of care and new kinds of ways of being um, together. Um, and I think that raises a lot of interesting questions and possibilities. Um, and this, this feels also like something that's very global, right? This, the, the kinds of ways in which bodies are um, uh, both conscripted, right? A compulsion of bodies to do many things like kill other people in the military, right? So, um, so I, I hope we can also get into that too. Absolutely, and I'm taking copious notes and I already have a few things that I think we can circle back to um, in some of the questions that are coming our way. But um, I think uh, for a lot of people who are watching the protests from the outside, um, there's confusion about who is on the streets, who is protesting, uh, what are their goals because of media blackouts. I mean, it's very intentional why there's confusion. Um, so it, for people who aren't Persian speakers or who don't have people on the ground who can help them navigate what's happening, I think um, a lot of times the protesters or who is protesting gets very abstracted, flattened. We just see them as one large mass with a unified mission and uh, central goals that are very clear. Um, and I hope to sort of like dig deeper into that. Um, and so um, maybe we'll start with Furul this time to just say, 
you know, um, who are the protesters? Um, do they all have the same vision of what they want in terms of, let's put like the larger political structure out there, but also even in terms of women's rights. Like we're saying in the previous question, all of you are really highlighting what's unique about this is that women's rights are really centered. Are the protesters, do they share the same vision of even what gender equality or, um, you know, what they want to see for women in the society? Do, do we see any sort of um, uh, unity in terms of what is being demanded on the streets? Um, so, Furo, if you want to take that first. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, great question, because I think we all have the tendency, not only the Western uh, liberal media, but we all have the tendency to give one image that we think we would serve. Um, to basically the future of the uprising. And I and I uh, do not want to do that, even though I have the tendency to do that as well. I would rather read the uprising within the socioeconomic uh, context of it. I would rather see it as part of the, the bigger movement that is under the banner of uh, woman life freedom, but is actually seeking something beyond that, which would be like bringing together socioeconomic civil aspects of our lives that have been constrained in a lot of ways together. But it at the same time, I think not to flatten that image um, for 40 years, uh, when you have this uh, binary image of uh, oppression versus freedom, not only fueled into the, the into the society by the Western media, but also by the regime itself. So both parties are feeding this image of oppression versus freedom, East versus West. Uh, and, and we all know the Nashari, Nagarbi, but Jomhuri Islami, the no to the West, no to the East, but the Islamic Republic being the, the way that kind of like Islamic Republic was trying to differentiate itself from any form of like, let's say Western or Eastern, like socialist or, uh, or capitalist parties that existed back then. And one of them is um, already gone. I think like what we need to do is to actually get to the grassroots and see the multiplicity that is happening in there. And some of that would actually fit into the image that the liberal Western media is trying to present. We have the Masih Hali Najad, and we have her supporters in Iran. Let's not forget that. But at the same time, what I think needs to be added to that image to, to make it less flattened is to remember Masih Hali Najad in her own context, in Voice of America, in her uh, pictures being taken with Pompeo and uh, her support of Trump, who later received where, to, where uh, kind of like it took the, um, American society's anti-abortion kind of like, you know, like uh, um, movement. So I think um, this is part of the image. One other image that we do not see that does not come out of Iran is where you have all those women from not necessarily the center, but actually the so-called periphery of the Iranian state, which would be in the borderlands. And now that connection is being made in the last 11 days and only in the last 11 days. So I guess what is important here is to not forget about that multiplicity and let the multiplicity that is meeting on the streets itself be voiced and uh, not to read something or impose a reading or interpretation upon it, but actually take those conversations out of that context and be like, these are the conversations that are being, that are happening between uh, student organizations in uh, which are usually considered the progressive women's and uh, uh, kind of like uh, young left-wing movements. And those people are now in conversation with, uh, with unions, with people in the streets, with, with, with uh, basically women who would watch Voice of America, who would basically take, get their information from BBC Persian. And there's nothing wrong with any of this. It's just like making this conversation finally happen all, and all these stigmas being put aside and then seeing what we can add to each other's conversations, basically. So I think like if we keep that in mind, but at the same time, not sad and the multiplicity, uh, the multiplicity that already existed and now is being voiced to, I think it would give a much better image of what's going on right now. Nahi, do you wanna jump in on that question as well? Sure, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I agree with Fru about the multiplicity, but I think this is going back to the first question that. You know, when we talk about what's unique and other speakers have, have, have pointed to this, it's that, you know, there's now this sort of um, percolation of this bare truth that women's freedom, uh, women's choices to dress as they wish and to live the lives that they wish is intimately connected to the freedom of the nation as a whole. And that, I think, is the truly unique aspect of these 
um, you know, of these protests versus the ones uh, that happened previously. And as Manija, I think, said, you know, women's sort of the hijab, not least because women didn't, especially, you know, sort of, you know, feminists, both in Iran and outside of Iran, didn't really want to engage with this uh, Western obsession of the of the hijab. And so for, you know, something like 40 decades, it's true, you know, they've been saying, the hijab is secondary. That is, let's just put it on the back burner. That's not important. And I think what's happening now, it's this realization because of sort of, you know, four years or so leading up to this, because of images we've seen, because of the Girls of Revolution Street and and so on, um, the sort of bare truth that there won't be uh, freedom from uh, repression unless women have their freedom. Um, and um, so there is multiplicity, but whether we're talking about feminists inside Iran or outside protesters on the streets, elsewhere, I think that is the one understanding they have. Um, and, um, and otherwise, you know, there's, as far as the hijab is concerned, I, I think uh, there have been several polls. Rouhani's government um, had a poll in 2018, I believe, where even the government's, uh, you know, reported results were that 49% of Iranians were against compulsory hijab. There was an independent uh, survey in 2020, uh, the results of which were that 72% of Iranians are against compulsory hijab. So we've kind of been uh, leading up, um, building up to this moment. moment. And uh, so on that issue, I think there is, uh, there, there seems to be a sort of, you know, widespread agreement. Yeah, and I think what's, what's really interesting is, I mean, nobody knows how things are gonna play out, but I think what's really interesting is I hear a lot of people saying, um, you know, we won't simply like, like imagine that the Iranian government said, okay, no more mandatory hijab. That's no longer enough. You know, it's not, it's no longer, that's no longer um, gonna cut it, you know, because as you said, Nahid, people understand that as a kind of nexus point, right? For the larger authoritarian structures of, of state violence and surveillance and control. And for the, and, and as a, as a, you know, quintessential or crystallizing um, symbol of all of the various oppressions, right, that are going on. So I think that's, that is the significant difference as well, right, is I don't think people are really willing to accept like a concession around one thing, right, they want total systemic um, transformation of their society. Um, yeah. I'll just add, um, I also think, I mean, this question of sort of who's out there on the street is, is really important, but I also think as in every movement, you know, there is a question of the, the kind of penetration of uh, resistance and protest and, um, you know, we're tired of uh, what's been happening for many, many, many years. We're tired of the ways in which, um, you know, Islam is spoken in our name, for instance, right? So that, I think there is a multiplicity, there's a penetration of sort of broad-based support of this movement. Um, even if some people out are, aren't out on the streets. And that's always true, I think, in these kinds of uprisings, right? The ways in which they, you know, are percolating everywhere, right? The sentiment, the feeling, but the, you know, there might only be certain bodies out there at certain times. Although it's, it's also true that lots of people are out on the streets. That actually segues perfectly into our next question, Catherine. Uh, I don't know if you did that on purpose, but, um, I, I think uh, we sort of jumped into the deep end of what's happening in the present moment, and we've made allusions to the past in the broader context. But now let's take a moment to actually do that um, that work of of broadening and understanding and deepening at the same time. Um, so while the street and the visuality of the protests, i.e., you know, burning headscarves, cutting your hair, these things are they're purposefully very powerful symbolic um, actions. They draw much of the attention globally and within Iran itself. Um, and we'll get into the Western coverage uh, toward the end of our discussion. But women have been struggling for their rights in Iran on multiple levels in various forms, in legal ways, in cultural ways, in political ways. Um, and I think this is a great opportunity because we have experts who have studied these things to sort of unpack some of that for us. Um, so I'm going to direct this first part of the question to Arzu. Um, can you talk a bit about how women in Iran have been struggling um, or fighting for their rights through political and legal channels? Um, you can you can kind of go as far back as you'd like um, in that question. Um, 
we can go back to Mashrutia or even before that if you want, or we can stick to the, the post-Islamic uh, Republic. Thank you. Um, let me just start with the 1979 revolution and then we can go back or forwards. But I think that you mentioned the visuality and this visual symbol of women, you know, declining or resisting the, the headscarf. And we also saw similar symbols of that going back to um, the early 80s, uh, the 1979, the, the March 6th, the, the women's movements in the streets. And we have to remember, though, that the Iranian revolution, people call it an Islamic revolution, but before that, it was actually, it, it included considerable support and involvement from the left, whether it was the religious left or the secular left. Um, and it turned out that, that what brought them together was an anti-imperialism and an anti-capitalism that aligned many of the values along with toppling a monarchy. <clears throat> and, and just comparing this to the coverage of the Queen's death in England shows you just how revolutionary Iran's movement now is. The woman question was a part of that broader revolution, as it was declared, the woman's question, was a key ideological concern of this revolutionary struggle, reforming the state and shirking off the empirical, uh, sorry, Im imperial yoke, um, as in other post-colonial societies, let's say India, um, that this would take place on women's bodies, right? So women's bodies have been integral to the establishment of the Islamic Republic of Iran. So what I argued in my first book was that two things simultaneously happened. On the one hand, women's rights, were, which were defined as freedom from you know, capitalist and imperialist exploitation would forever be bound with this revolutionary struggle. And we all know that the Englelabe Islami, the Islamic revolution is in Iran's constitution. So, Two things happened. So as I said, the first one was that women's rights were forever bound with the revolutionary struggle that established this Islamic Republic. But the second point, which emerges from this first point, is that women in post-revolutionary Iran were now made to have expectations for those rights, those freedoms, and dignity that made them the key ideological symbols of the revolutionary struggle. And this, this was a discursive move, but it was also a materialist move that women were now looking for tangible um, results from this. Um, the other thing, many of you have you know, written about this, heard about this, but the, the idea of the chador, the black full covering tent-like garment was a very important ideological locator of this new country. And one member of the Olama, Ayatollah Talagani, whose daughter was a, a very progressive um, reformist later on, but Ayatollah Talagani in 1982 said, we want the Iranian women to don this chador to show the world that something has changed. So they took it up initially as a very important element. So it speaks to why it's so difficult now to challenge it, but it also speaks to the myriad concerns that have coalesced around this compulsion. You know, if we're forced to wear the headscarf, where are our rights? Where is our dignity? Where is our liberty? Where, you know, where is our food, you know, where are, not just women's rights, you know, as others have said, but where is, where are all of these anti-imperialist promises that sparked the revolution and the protests that included so much of Iran's population at that time? Does anybody else want to jump on that element of it as sort of um, what, what have women been doing um, historically? What is the history there um, in terms of what women have been doing on other fronts besides um, being on the street? Um, and maybe I'll direct the um, forms of like 
cultural contestation and protest towards um, Nahid, if you're willing to take it up, um, it's sort of what are the broader ways women have been asserting their voices? And then even beyond women's rights, how have people been um, sort of trying to create spaces of political dissent through other means? Sure, thank you. There is more to be said in the in the legal realm, and I hope we can get back to that a little bit. But you know, all the organizing and campaigning that's happened over the last forty years, and um, and so on, and um, one that people often talk about is the one million signatures campaign. And I think it's an important one to talk about uh, because of its sort of lack of focus on the hijab, actually, um, but focus on other other important elements. Um, but in terms of the cultural realm, I think what we see over the last forty years, but especially, I would say you know, over the last, um, as far as filmmakers are concerned, right, Iran has more female film directors than most Western countries. And in their productions, you see real critical, um, uh, you know, representations of, of gender relations in Iran, gender equality. So all of that work's been doing, uh, has been done, uh, you know, by somebody like Rahshanabani Etemad, um, Milani, all these people have been putting work out there, these female for, uh, film directors that have been viewed by Iranians in Iran, in Iranian cinemas. And so people have been engaging with these questions in the cultural realm, uh, but especially since uh, the, um, you know, sort of onset of the internet, but, but specifically sort of the social media aspect of it over the last decade, what we see is that, you know, this, um, the, the cultural uh, regulations that have been applied to certain realms uh, uh, affecting women, such as the ban on solo female singing, right? Um, all these sort of regulations have been um, taken down on social media. So what we see in the public sphere uh, is a different picture than the presentation we've seen on social media. And so over the last 10 years, what you know, the Iran that we see is a different one than the Iran that is permitted. So there's this huge rift between what the government officially is allowed to permit and the sort of everyday mundane uh, life that Iranian women have been carrying on, whether as musicians or in their private spheres. And so the, uh, you know, the distribution and mediation of these everyday acts of whether it's singing in your kitchen or highly polished actually music videos with solo female vocals. Um, and more recently over the last three, four years of women very much sort of, you know, taking, um, uh, sort of untethering their bodies from state control uh, in very sort of public spontaneous acts of dancing on the streets. Um, so we've seen this this happening in, in, in on social media on this sort of you know um, sphere independent from state control that Iranians, the majority of Iranians partaking, like everybody else and most not everybody else, but most people who have access to electricity and phones and the internet in the world, uh, right? They've, they've been living their lives partly on social media and engaging in this other sphere, which I think has gradually just, um, you know, allowed for this, this spillover from that life that people have been living quite publicly on social media, not in the physical spaces of the Islamic Republic, into the public sphere, right? Sort of these this breaking down of barriers of what is permissible, what is possible, what is already part of everyday life. And I think that's something important that we need to sort of keep in mind when we talk about how have we come to this moment? How has this been made possible? Um, and I think we do need to really factor in this alternative sort of life on social media that's been, uh, you know, that's been that Iranians have been engaging in over the last decade. I wanted just to say a quick thing, kind of connecting what Arzu and, and Nahid are saying about, you know, this, the, the ways in which women drew on the promises made to them, the kind of post-revolutionary decades, and then the sort of every day. Um, uh, and I think that the One Million Signatures campaign, you know, which emerges in 2006 after several years of, um, of you know, pushing for reforms in family law, uh, brings those together really nicely because it it both says, look, you know, we were promised that this is a new society, right? That you know, uh, Islam was about uh, honoring women, women's equality, right? Um, and and the vision of this sort of equality in these gender differentiated terms doesn't work for us. So we want to talk about right, uh, our vision of equality. And also, I think importantly, brought the everyday, right? The shifts in consciousness, the fact that in people's homes, um, they were struggling around gender roles, 
right? The, the, the fact that younger people were having a new vision of, of sort of gender equality and justice. And, and the campaign, in my estimation, really drew on that and said, look, right, things have shifted. Women have a vibrant presence in society. They are political actors. They have been mobilizing, you know, before the revolution, but certainly in the post-revolutionary uh, uh, period. And the, the sort of presence of women, this idea that women are social actors, that they're agents in their society, that they are, you know, highly educated, you know, that, that the revolution gave them that in many ways, that new groups of women came out to society. So it doesn't make sense to have these discriminatory laws, you know, was, was part of the, the way in which that was argued. And I think that um, that was a really uh, a moving uh, and interesting campaign to, to sort of, on the one hand, very pragmatic, thinking about, you know, there is this space and there was more space in certain, you know, governments than, than others in certain periods to reform law. And there were some victories. I think it's important to say that there were some victories. Um, but to, now I lost my train of thought, um, to say that there's, oh yes, that it's a kind of pragmatic reform oriented movement, but it reflects something deeper about the ways in which people's, people have changed around this question and our desire, right? Um, uh, women's equality, not just women, but other people in the society, right? And that, um, that there was a kind of sense in bringing that widespread um, desire of the society to a reform campaign, I think reflected um, uh, all of what people were just talking about. And if I can jump on that for a minute to bring it back to Arzu, um, there's also, you know, there's there's the one million women's signature campaign. There's these big sort of reform oriented movements uh, where women are placing themselves. And then there's these cultural forms that Nahid is also speaking to. Um, but then there's quieter forms um, and sort of everyday forms that women are asserting themselves in the legal system, um, whether that's in family court or in, uh, you know, cases you've you've worked on murder and, and forgiveness and those sorts of ways that women are really asserting themselves yeah. in these really powerful ways legally um, in Iran. If you can just you know touch on that as well. Arzu. Oh yes, thank you. I I don't I don't want to talk too much when it, it was my turn. So um I want to remind everyone that the Islamic Republic is an innovation. It's an experiment. And many, many of the activists, the nationalists, the, the people involved in the, in the um, revolution that brought about this formation um, didn't really know what they were doing. I mean, they didn't know what they were going to end up with. And it was part of a broader compromise. But what it did give people was these like branches of government, a legislative branch of government, um, a judiciary. And, and I'm not saying those things didn't exist before, but, but with this sort of sheen of concession or accession to Islam, right? And, and now what, what people were fighting for was through legal and constitutional support to make good on the promises of this post-revolutionary constitution. And one of the ways that this was happening when I was in Iran, again, starting in the late 90s, was fighting for reform through judicial activism, in the legislature, in the courts, and everyday people going to court. And one thing that I observed was that because of um, the sort of discriminatory interpretations of some of these laws, we come to find that the Shah Sharia is highly interpretable. Who knew? Because the constitution states that there's gender equality. Women and men are equal, which by the way, the US constitution doesn't have. Many post-colonial constitutions have this great language. So women were realizing that, wait a second, like I, I don't have the, these things. What was really interesting was that women had to go to court, let's say, to file grievances against <clears throat> a husband or someone. And what they realized was they needed to build a case. But the men, they didn't need a reason in this interpretation of the Sharia back then 
to get a divorce. So what was the effect of this? Well, this forced women, like housewives, women living at home, working out inside the home to read Iran's civil code on marriage and family. Little by little, women gained tremendous legal knowledge, not to mention skill. Women were deeply skilled at making legal claims and filing petitions in court. One of my venues of doing fieldwork was the Jalasey Quran or Quranic scriptural reading groups, which many of you know have been going on in Iran for centuries and not just in Iran. But what I was really struck by was the way that these women were inserting what I would call feminist readings into their reading of the Quran and Republican, with a small r, readings into the Quran, saying we're individuals. Um, we're not supposed to have a mediated relationship with God. We can't expect somebody else to tell us what all of this means. So at this Jalasey Quran, this Quran scriptural reading group, they read the Quran, but they also, like they had a woman lawyer come and tell women how to file a complaint to get a divorce. Like how much you have to pay to get the right kind of uh, filing fees. They also had women politicians come and talk about how to do voting blocks for parliamentarians. <clears throat> so these early um, post-war with Iraq, to the mid 2000s, I would say, was a very exciting time in Iran because coalitions of made up of women, but also men were coming together to push for legal reform, coming in from the ground floor. And so we saw women making claims before judges in courts, winning decisive um, uh, decisions. Um, when I went back, so if I did my big field work in 2000, when I went back in 2000 and I don't know, six or seven, I met with one of these women lawyers and I said, well, what do you think about women's rights now? And she said, oh, before women didn't know their rights. Now they know them too well. Um, so there has been a lot of legal reform to the point where if men don't, after a divorce, if men don't pay the bride price that um, is required of them, um, they can go to jail. And I have met in, in 2019, the last time I was in Iran, I met so many men who were so angry because either they had spent time in jail or were going to jail because they didn't pay this decisive award. And at that time, the, the government was looking into how to change it because women had become too powerful because they had been this, this Islamic Republic system, which kind of made it easy for men forced women to become legal advocates for their own cases. And they did it so well that the reforms have, there has been somewhat of a backlash. To my knowledge, that law has not yet changed. However, um, some things have changed. Men now do need to go to court to get a divorce. They have to state a reason, even though according to that interpretation of the Shah, they're not supposed to need one. Um, there were rules about child custody um, women fought, and that was another issue in 1998 when um, custody of young children, boys starting at two and girls at the age of seven, would automatically be given to a man, the, the father, for, for economic logics much more than, than otherwise. Um, but what was really interesting about this was that there was another issue where a child was killed, in this case, by her father, by her a drug addict abusive father. And this was a spark that allowed the law to change. So there have been judicial reforms, but some of these really important judicial activists, like Faze Hashemi, the daughter of Rafsanjani, who was a member of, of one of the early parliaments, who um, has now, you know, who, she, when I went to Iran for the first time, she had a, a newspaper, a daily, called Zen. I mean, how many countries in the world have a daily newspaper just dedicated to women's issues? Um, so these changes in, you wanted me to talk about the legal reforms, legal reforms in divorce have, have been very um, important for, for women's lives. Um, custody battles have been important. A lot of the things that people say, let's say uh, when someone is murdered in Iran, um, 
you know, there's a compensation that's paid. Um, people say, oh, women's is half of men's. That's actually been adjusted. So many people don't know this, but in the criminal codes, there is a provision where one can petition the government to pay that other half. So women's um, uh, die or compensation is no longer, you know, the, the, they, they try to find these workarounds. So the Islamic Republic says, well, this is in the shadow, we can't change it. But what they do is they add a, a, a procedural reform that says, okay, you can petition the government. So we're not disrupting our interpretation of the shadow, we're still Islamic, but we're going to allow, uh, allow a procedural fix for this. And we see this with uh, automobile accidents as well, where if it used to be that if a man were killed because he's the breadwinner ostensibly, um, the payout is twice or is whole, let's say it for one person, whereas the payout for a woman driver who is killed in an auto accident would have been half. Now that's been fixed. The, um, the, the government actually does force all insurance companies and the government itself will pay that extra half, so to speak. Um, so there are these legal workarounds um, obviously, the, the laws in place that still privilege patriarchal governance are being challenged, and, and that's what I think is really important, and I hope that we can go back to um, Catherine's point about the issue of the importance of bodily integrity, and I know we're going to talk about the West, but I think I didn't used to hear it as um, as much of an, it was much more of an issue of, oh, do I have to wear the headscarf? It's not the most important thing in my life. I much rather get my rights in marriage and divorce and child custody and what legal rights. But, but now that's changed to something about, I have a right to bodily autonomy. I have a right to individual rights. And again, these are consecrated in Iran's post-revolutionary discourse, in Iran's constitution, and in Iran's civil codes, which make everyone an individual. So, so I'm interested in this new expression of bodily integrity as the basis for these um, protests. And I think it's really important to think about how men have now become involved, if I can just say one last thing, is that I remember once I was going to Iran, and for anyone who's been to Iran, you know that when you land, the flight attendants come out and say, oh, you know, this is the Islamic Republic of Iran, by law, you all have to put on your headscarf. And a gentleman sitting next to me, this was like in 2005, turned to me and said, oh, I'm so sorry for you. And I said, why are you sorry for me? I feel sorry for you. And he's like, but what do you mean? Like, kind of, I'm free. And I said, what does this say about you? That you you are, I'm forced to cover my head for you? So I think that there is kind of, we talk about women's awakening, but I think there's much more of an awakening about bodily integrity as related to men as well, because women have been aware of these challenges for centuries, I would say. So sorry for speaking so long. No, I'm glad you brought that back. And I also, um, there was a question from the audience that relates to this as well. And so I'm gonna tie it in to the second part of the question I'm gonna ask about transnational solidarity. So thank you for bringing us full circle. Those are really important for people to understand the multiple ways that these struggles are being uh, fought and enacted. And they're not limited to the street, but the street right now is where we're at. And we wanna talk about what, that means for the women of Iran in this moment. So, so to now come back, <laughs> I want to ask Manija and Catherine in particular, Iranians have been calling for international solidarity, and I'm talking about Iranians inside Iran. Um, what are the possibilities for building a transnational feminist movement in support of the uprising in Iran, and what are the challenges to that? Um, maybe I'll start and then turn over to Catherine. Um, so I think I think it's really um, important, really significant that there is a call from so many Iranians who are risking their lives right now for international solidarity. 
Um, and I think in order to, to really take that seriously and put that into practice, there's a few things that um, we need to be clear about for those of us who are um, not in Iran, and especially those of us who are in places like the United States, which have been you know, targeting Iran in so many ways for over 40 years. So I think we have to be clear that this is an uprising of Iranian people who want to get rid of their repressive government, right? So they wanna choose their future and their government for themselves. So first and foremost, this is about self-determination, right? Not a call for um, you know, intervention by Western governments or states and things like that. So I think standing in solidarity means recognizing that what's happening on the ground in Iran right now is historic. Um, and it should serve as an inspiration to feminists and social justice activists everywhere who are engaged in so many different struggles against patriarchal violence, against police state violence, mass incarceration, censorship, um, and efforts by so many different kinds of right-wing forces to control women's bodily autonomy, to deny women and queer and trans people full equality in their societies, right? So I think that Iranians in the streets, they want to know that people everywhere care what happens to them. You know, they're very isolated and they're being arrested and shot. They're really risking their lives. The internet is shut down uh, for much of the day as people know. So I think in the face of that kind of state violence, our weapon is solidarity, right? It's kind of all we actually have, if you really think about it, you know? Um, and I was reminded of the slogan, the whole world is watching, which I think was first chanted by Americans who were protesting the Vietnam War in 1968 and they were being beaten up by police and they wanted to call attention to the state violence, the violent suppression of this very legitimate dissent. Um, and I think that that, but I think that slogan, you know, what would it mean to bring that sentiment to bear on Iran right now? You know, we want the whole world to be watching, right? How the police and the military behave, um, to be posting videos, denouncing the violence. We want to apply pressure from below internationally right, against the Iranian regime, not to use mass force, not to, you know, use that horrible, you know, option, right, to stop shooting and arresting people right now. So I think we have to organize outside Iran to make it a reality that any mass crackdown there would ignite a popular global uproar, you know, and so to me, that's really, in some ways, the most important thing that those of us outside of Iran um, can do right now. I mean that's beautiful. I don't. I don't know really what to add. I think. I think that's so important. And I think um, uh, to frame this as part of a global movement, right? That there have been global uprisings for the last couple of decades. That um, that this is its own uprising, and it should be seen as its own uprising with particular characteristics and aspirations and goals. But it's part of a kind of epochal shift that I think is, um, there are many people, including us in the US who are fed up with, right? The kinds of politics as usual and who feel that we need more substantial, deeper changes that reflect our desires. And uh, I think this is, this is a kind of sentiment in many, many places. And so, yes, I think sovereignty is key. And I think that, you know, we have to, you know, we say different things in different spaces, but I think it's really important in all of the spaces to say that the sort of sovereignty of the people and the sovereignty of gendered subjects who are demanding that the kind of particular ways in which, you know, uh, the, the state security is inscribed on their bodies is, is not okay, that you can say those things together, that those things together, we, we sort of said this at the very beginning, right, that um, these things will not be separated, that, that we will not allow them, we, we, we don't allow a choice between one or the other, that, um, that the sort of uh, uh, bodily descent of, of women and others um, is part of this larger struggle, and that we have to, those, those forms of sovereignty come together and are, you know, absolutely indivisible. Um, and I think this this is happening in, in different places, you know, in different kinds of ways. So I think to really focus on, you know, Iran as part of the world, um, and uh, Manish is absolutely right. I think um, uh, uh, we we must 
learn from this. We must listen. We must talk about it. We this is this is an incredible example of um, something that is unfolding that I think uh, will have ramifications and should have ramifications for everyone, no matter where they're situated. I just wanted to add one thing about. Uh... Uh, the new forms of solidarity that are coming not only from Iranian uh, diaspora, but also uh, independent feminist groups from other places. And I think that's something to celebrate and see that like they are recognizing and acknowledging the very um, contextual and local specificities of the Iranian women's movement, but at the same time, finding ways to connect it to their own movement coming from Chile, the Philippines, Afghan, Turkish women, Lebanese and Iraqi women. And I just wanted to read uh, two lines from uh, uh, the Afghan women's uh, statement of uh, solidarity with Iran because I think it touches upon something that like would connect all these women who are fighting against the same thing in different shades and forms together. It says, women, um, we women of Afghanistan, as well as a number of people and groups supporting gender equality, decisively signed this statement to express our belief that each and every government around the world, whether in so-called democratic or dictatorial form, have placed the deprivation and condemnation of women as their priority. And this refers to nothing but patriarchy and its ruling system in the whole world. We object to such a system and we'll never reduce it to a national government. So I think it's, it's really important to see like this coming from especially Afghan women uh, going through very similar things. And, and the statement is long and, and beautifully talks about like the overlapping aspects of the uh, Afghan and Iranian women's fight, but at the same time saying that this is not about is uh, like uh, Islamic autocracy, not Islam for sure, but Islamic autocracy or Islamic government. Uh, and this is not specifically about Iran or Afghanistan or the Middle East, but it can actually go beyond those uh, boundaries. So, so I think this is a powerful way of thinking about how solidarity can be built without forgetting about specificities, but at the same time, keeping it independent um, and autonomous from hijacking movements that already exist forever, especially when it comes to Iran and its um, last four decades. So. This uh, relates um, to a question from one of our viewers, Maya, um, who asked, um, you spoke of these protests in terms of a fem feminist framework of bodily and political rights. How might these protests and demands be put into conversation with global crackdowns and feminist resistance on the question of bodily and political rights? And then most of you have sort of touched on that, but this last part is, is uh, where... Uh, I wanted you to focus next is in what other ways are women's slash people's bodies regulated in Iran? So maybe you guys can tease that out a little bit as well. So how does this relate to sort of what's happening globally, but then also what is specifically happening in Iran um, in terms of um, bodily, how the body is being regulated? Uh, I can speak briefly uh, to that. Um, the body is being regulated, not just in terms of hijab, but also, and, uh, you know, people have done work on this in terms of comport, uh, comportment in the public space, um, so that, you know, that is why these, uh, you know, viral dance videos that we've seen over the last few years are so important, um, because certain kinds of comportment uh, have not been considered to be appropriate or, you um, uh, you know, not exactly sort of uh, within the um, a committed or uh, revolutionary uh, discourse of the of the state as as to what is appropriate in terms of how one comports oneself in the public space, and this applies also to men, by the way, and to young men, and that's why you know every every sort of once in a while, every couple of years, we'll see these um, very huge blowouts of especially very young people engaging in this precisely sort of pushing back against that kind of those kinds of, um, you know, moral impositions on what is acceptable and what is not acceptable with, as uh, within the within the public and sort of ethical space and engaging in whether it's water fights or, um, you know, skateboarding uh, um, contests, very public ones. Um, and I think you know, since since I'm mentioning these events that really involve mostly very young people, something that we haven't really pointed out is that, and this is something that we hear from people in Iran over the last uh, 11, 12 days, that um, there there is a real 
um, majority of very young people in the in these protests, right? 16 year olds, 17 year olds, who somehow are not really bound or beholden uh, to uh, to these um, to the to the to the discourses that that Iranians of perhaps older generations uh, are somehow you know um, conditioned to be responsive to whether it's through their education as a kid having gone through you know primary schooling in in Iran in the eighties um, you know this sort of feeling of um, indebtedness indebtedness and guilt towards the uh, blood of the martyrs for, in the Iran Iraq War and. These are these are not to be taken lightly, right? The way in which Iranians are conditioned over decades to to feel uh, to feel a certain way toward uh, you know for themselves and toward their society and toward their state, and so I think it's not surprising that the kinds of boundary breaking that we see uh, have been coming from sort of a much younger generation who are less beholden to these discourses, not least because um, you know again um, because their lives have been so much more interconnected. So when we talk about transnational solidarity or just think about sort of the global context, because their lives have been just much more interconnected globally with uh, young lives elsewhere and they're consuming, uh, you know, spending half their lives on social media and consuming all kinds of uh, videos, whether it's on TikTok or elsewhere and contributing to them. And so they've sort of managed to somehow surpass the space um, that I think, um, you know, older generations perhaps couldn't so easily surpass. And uh, which is why also another sort of unique aspect of these protests, this goes back to the first question, is that, you know, from the very beginning, uh, the demands were clear. So this was not one where people sort of slowly grew into saying down with the dictator or, you know, we don't want this regime. This was there from the very beginning. Um. And if I can add, I think the, the other thing that we see because of the generational component that thank you, Nahid, for bringing that into the center, it's so important, is that there's really no, um, there's no um, um, concern or that like, there's not a worry about how this will be read in the West or how this might feed into Islami Islamophobia in the West. That's just, people don't care. They want their freedom. They want their liberation. They don't want mandatory hijab and they don't want a religious government, right? And they're not concerned with how that plays, you know, in, you know, but I, so I think I, I think I'm, I'm raising this because I see a question in the um, chat um, from Parisa, how do you center Iran and Iranian women in this conversation when talking to non-Iranians in the US without being forced into the fold of Islamophobia and anti-Middle Eastern racism. And I think this is so important, not because we always need to worry about how, how everything is seen in the US, but because we wanna build international solidarity. <laughs> and if you wanna build international solidarity or transnational feminist solidarity, you have to actually be able to address these issues, right? Um, and you have to actually be able to talk to people um, in the United States and you know explain that this is this is absolutely about hijab, but it's about hijab in an Iranian context. It's about the state forcing women to wear hijab and that making them vulnerable constantly to state violence and harassment, right? And preventing their full equality in the society. Um, it is not about hijab everywhere, all the time, in every country and context. It is not about a universal hijab, which doesn't exist, right? It is about hijab in Iran. And we don't have to be squeamish about that. We have to be absolutely clear because that is the, the clarity on the streets in Iran and that is the demand in Iran. But what I was what I tried to say, you know, yesterday I was teaching, I have many students who wear hijab. And I said to them the same way that we have to defend the right of Iranian women not to be forced to wear hijab is the same way we would have to march here to defend your right to wear hijab, right? That it depends on the context, but it's there has to be a clarity around um, opposing the state from controlling women's bodies, right? That has to be the unifying. And I think that that can be the basis for international solidarity because that is what resonates. You know, the, the outrage that women in America felt when Roe v. Wade was over, overturned, like that idea that the state is going to tell me what I get to do. I mean, okay, you know, we, we have our version 
of that rage, you know, where we want to go into the streets and we and and actually I think we're not as advanced as people in Iran in terms of figuring out how to, you know, really resist um, our own uh, patriarchal authoritarian uh, elements, you know, here. Um, but I think we just have to be really clear that, you know, this is not about, um, I mean, there are so many people on the streets of Iran who are, who are saying, you know, they're doing these things in the name of Islam. This is not my Islam, you know? So, you know, this is a fight about, you know, about how people want to actually live. It's, you know, and uh, not again, it's not a religious versus secular. I don't even think that's accurate. Although many people in Iran want a secular government, but they're not anti-Islam, right? Um, people are horrified about what's being done in the name of their faith and in the name of their religion. And they very much want to take it away from the state, you know, having a monopoly um, on defining Islam. And that has been true for a very long time. You know, that has been true for a very long time. And I, I, I would just add too, I think I, I've been really struck by this uprising, looking at it sort of side by side with a lot of Russian men fleeing conscription, you know, and thinking about without going, you know, abstracting it too much, but, but really making these connections with our students in particular that, you know, no matter what the form of the state is, it requires a, a, a certain compulsion that is gendered and racialized and, and you know, about sexuality and class and all of those things. And, and that people are, again, dissenting, right, in their bodies. Uh, they are uh, moving away from those um, compulsions of all kinds, right, to, to connect um, to, to connect these compulsions while also, right, um, not sort of taking away from the very specific nature of this kind of bodily descent. I'm going to hand it off to Bassam who wants to make a point, and then we are going to actually directly address this question of, you know, how the protests situate themselves within this broader global context. So, Bassam. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Nigar and everyone. Um, I have been listening and uh, happy to uh, yield to this whole discussion because of how remarkable it has been. But before we move forward and uh, before I address the global context, I would like to share that uh, the person who asked the question uh, that Nigar shared is Maya Megdashi who will actually be speaking at uh, George Mason and, of course, here on Jadalia slash ASI uh, on Friday. Uh, also online, I will share very quickly uh, the uh, uh, announcement. I'm not sure if you'll be able to see it, but let's see. Uh, so this will be uh, broadcast live at 1 p.m. this Friday. Uh, this is Maya's book on, uh, which just came out from Stanford on sectarianism, sovereignty, secularism, and the state in Lebanon. And I hope you all can join us because it is a, another, uh, I presume, another form of uh, continuing the conversation uh, along very similar lines. Um, so please join us Friday at 12 p.m. or sorry, at 1 p.m. Eastern time for this conversation. And I'll now move to addressing the global question, which is always a thorny question when it comes to uh, states like Iran and Syria because of the multiple uh, and overlapping contentions. Uh, and the question basically is a series of questions, and I hope that we can have a discussion about it um, so that uh, we can address the different dimensions. So can we acknowledge uh, how Iran, uh, sorry, basically, can, can we acknowledge the broader pol political global context without centering the West always, given that the Iranian diaspora is actually uh, spread out throughout the West and Iran itself exists in a very broad and uh, contentious context. And in relation to that, um, how much and to what extent can we uh, talk about what's happening inside Iran right now without taking into account how it's being portrayed or represented in uh, U.S. media in particular, but also Western media more uh, generally and to or for Western audiences. So if we can just address these issues and feel free to take any tangents that uh, are not included in these uh, in these questions. Thank you. I, I would like to say uh, something about that. Um, 
one thing that has come out of this conversation, but also just watching um, what's happening inside Iran is that there's a tremendous sense of fed upness, right? And I think that that is not um, exclusive to Iran or the regime, as people say, the government in Iran, but it is actually an effect of uh, the geopolitical context and flows of capital from global so so uh, south to north. And then um, we can see the same with forced migration. But what I'm trying to get at is that um, we are seeing um, challenges to the nation state system. We see individuals who are seeking a new articulation of the relationship between human rights and the state's responsibility towards people. Um, and I think that's something that we can, we can not just attribute to um, a patriarchal government in Iran, but also to um, cases of humanitarian catastrophes that are happening because of the global climate disaster, because of uh, structural adjustment in societies that have had problems, you know, paying back their uh, their World Bank loans. Um, and what we're seeing is an increase in humanitarian types of care. So governments are now doling out benefits or giving handouts because of the very systems that have now impoverished people. And and Iran is a great example because it's it's a society in which people are at, at experiencing humanitarian crisis at the hands of international actors, direct pressure from the US in the form of so-called maximum pressure, but also within their own context. So we see increasingly around the world these, these humanitarian situations that call for care and people are saying, we don't want your benevolence, man. We want our rights. So I think that this kind of articulation is something important in this era to um, for, for scholars in particular who study this stuff to really latch onto and think about more, more completely, I guess. Maybe I can respond to the question of the diaspora. I think the question of the diaspora, as much as we want to keep you know, the conversation to sort of focus on Iran. I think the question of the diaspora is a very important one when it comes to the Iranian context, because as we know, there are millions of Iranians of various sort of degrees of uh, departure from Iran, right? So there are some who very recently left Iran. Um, there are some who left Iran at, you know, following the 2009 Green Movement, others who left 20 years ago and others. So you have this sort of, you know, a very sort of staggered wave of uh, Iranian um, uh, diasporic communities abroad. And uh, given the fairly close media system within Iran itself, um, I don't think some of these conversations would have been able to been had so easily without the establishment of some of these diasporic expat television channels, which many Iranians, um, you know, that's where their source of news is, depending on sort of their you know, their preferences, whether it's uh, BBC Persian or Iran International or whatnot. Um, but they do, uh, you know, a large number of Iranians do receive their information um, uh, if, you know, from these expat television uh, news programs. And I think um, sort of the question of media is an important one when we consider, um, you know, what is the role of the diaspora? And I think um, it can be quite, um, you know, disruptive and even damaging at times. And we've seen this with other sort of situations where, you know, certain people will play into the hands of the West trying to portray the movement in Iran in a certain light, uh, sometimes or oftentimes kind of in a, you know, very sort of, you know, um, pathological or like sad way, which is sort of the representation that I've seen that I that I most dislike, because, you know, what's happening in Iran is defiant. And it's, uh, you know, if not directly joyous, it's certainly, uh, you know, very energetic and um, sort of this representation that we see often in uh, Western media of these like poor Iranian women who have been repressed. And, you know, the, the narrative and the story we need to tell is the opposite of that. It's the story of how Iranian women over the course of the last 40 years, over the course of, you know, the last 100 years, you can even go back, you know, further to Poratul Ain, who like in the 1850s, I think, you know, at, at her 
execution because of unveiling said, you can kill me as soon as you want, but you won't be able to stop women's emancipation. Um, it's a very hopeful one, actually. And I think the arc of it is, you know, uh, leading us to a bright place. Um, but uh, anyway, I, I don't know where I'm going with this. Uh, I'll, I'll shut up. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll just jump in and say, I think we, we do really have to talk about the transnational and the global because Raisi is, he's making those connections. He's saying, oh, you, you, he's screaming at the UN, you want to talk about um, state violence? The US is, you know, uh, you know, one of the biggest promoters of police brutality which of course he's right, but that's not his message, right? That's, that's activist method. So we can't concede that ground. And, you know, the other vision of transnational solidarity is, is not our friend at all, Elon Musk, right? G giving Starlink, which is, you know, spreading malware, which I think is an appropriate sort of metaphor or something. Um, so I think that we, you know, we can't concede that we have to, we have to worry about the fraught nature of all of these discussions. But we have to put another narrative out there, you know, that that we've been trying to outline. We can, we can't concede the ground, and we we don't have obviously control over the, the the many narratives that are out there. But we, I think we we have to we have to build a robust vision of solidarity that Manny J I think has outlined that um, is meaningful to people everywhere, and and really think about um, you know the fact that. There is something different about the global uprisings of the last many years in terms of, um, you know, they're, they're largely leaderless and this is an incredible strength that's beautiful and an incredible weakness too. And I think we have wrestled with that in our own context with Occupy Wall Street and, you know, with many of the kind of uprisings that we're trying to figure out how, how do you scale them up to more, um, you know, systemic uh, change, does it, does it mean a different kind of state? Does it mean no state? What does it mean? These are debates that people are having in their societies. And I think there's lots of, of connections across many regions of the world um, that we can, we can pull out and draw out and have those debates. And just on that note, I just want to put it Put in a plug for actually there's um, a call for an international day of feminist solidarity with the uprising in Iran for this Sunday, October 2nd. Um, and hopefully in cities and countries all around the world, we, we very much hope people will respond to that call, not just um, Iranians in diaspora, but but again, you know, feminist social justice activists in countries around the world who can recognize in the uprising in Iran something that resonates deeply with their own desires for liberation, right? And who want to uplift that struggle and make sure um, that we're all paying attention and learning and following and supporting um, what's happening in Iran. So Sunday, October 2nd is that feminist call for transnational solidarity. And I think globally, you know, our sort of our forces, our ability to really do transnational solidarity it has been very, very weakened by intense levels of state repression. I think that's something that's true in so many parts of the world, that we have weak lefts, we have weak feminist movements, we have, you know, it's not true everywhere, but, you know, that there is, um, it, if we can't imagine a kind of alternative to the international community of nation states, if we can't imagine another force in the world that we can turn to when things like this happen to apply so-called pressure on the Iranian government, then I think people end up back in the dead end of wishing that global, you know, that nation states were gonna come to their aid in a sort of benevolent way. So I think the onus is really upon us, you know, and people all over the world to continue to work to build that that alternative, that that third force, right? That that um, that force of solidarity from below. Well, we're really coming to the end of our time here, and I want to give everybody an opportunity to sort of um, talk about what lays ahead, which is in some ways the most difficult and terrible question to put on anybody when it comes to a country like Iran is to you know what what lays ahead. And I think there's been a few questions from the audience in terms of like, does this mean uh, removing of the mandatory uh, hijab? Does this mean like complete change on the ground? Does what what does what comes next? 
in other words. Um, and we don't have a lot of time. So unfortunately, I'm, I'm going to pass it to all of you. But if you can just be mindful of time um, when you answer, that would be great. So um, Furu, why don't you uh, start? Uh, I think I think nobody can. Uh, I don't think anybody has the right to to uh, even assume a future for for this movement, especially considering its multiplicity that we've been talking about for an hour and a half now. And I think one thing that I want to mention is that uh, the state's uh, repression is getting intensified these days. The last two days, three days, have been a lot worse. I have not heard back from my family for more than twenty four hours now. Uh, the internet uh, shutdown is real and uh, the troops are in the streets. There are tanks, military tanks in the streets now. And I think um, the the most recent uh, um, kind of like turn in the events has been uh, the call for national strikes, which first started in Kurdistan. And that was through more like, let's say, nationalist, ethnic nationalistic groups through Kurdistan. And there was a lot of resistance against it because uh, a lot of... Uh, uh, Kurdish communities were also pushing against the idea of making it a, about Kurdistan, and it already was out of the picture for, for after two days. Now it's national strikes, and I think this is something to take seriously and think about uh, as as another step towards that solidarity that is being built among generations of women with other people of Iran. Um, and um, at the same time, think about how uh, from the image of uh, Mahsa Amini, we are moving on to seeing all these other images coming out. And it's not just one face. And yes, it is leaderless, but at the same time, it's like multiple people joining this image and adding color to the, to the basically the first image of the, the revolution, I would call it now. And I think um, we, we need to also recognize the fact that a lot of different factions and groups from within Iran and diaspora and, and Iranian diaspora outside are calling it a revolution intentionally as a way of showing solidarity with the national strikes and also this um, um, basically um, thinking about the fact that only 11 days passed, this is this widespread not only within Iran, but outside. This is this is just to celebrate. And also, I think, just to end my notes uh, quickly, I think uprisings and revolutions are about imagining different futures. And that already is happening for, for a long time in Iran, but right now so powerfully that, it, that this will not be forgotten. And it will be leading us to different avenues wherever it would be, so. I could just say one thing uh, quickly. Um, I I love Furu's attention to the global, and um, I want to say at at the at issue is basically an alleged murder. At the very very spark of it, right at the very ground level, and the governments all around the world, when there are these kinds of uprisings, seek a face saving kind of not a resolution or a solution even, but just a way to diminish, lessen the pressure on them. So there's going to be a murder trial, right? There's going to be some kind of very uh, small accountability offered up. And um, there's going to be some way that this is trying, they're gonna try to channel this through existing legal channels to say, look, we're, we're you know, following our own laws and we can handle, we're not a failed state, right? We have a, a working state system. So there's going to be some of that, I think, too. But I agree, never speculate. It's wrong to speculate. Yeah, if I might chime in, um, agreed. And, um, you know, what, we've, what we're basically seeing is the state doing, just doing what it's always done. Um, so it's already trying to spin the narrative. So we're now seeing on state television, the narrative that you know, this is all kind of the, the work of the Kurdish Democratic Party that the Kurd separatists are kind of behind driving this movement, trying to bring about a rift uh, among uh, Iranian protesters. And um, as far as there was a question, uh, you know, there were two questions about, you know, is, is it likely that the state might um, might renege on, on the on the imposition of on the um, compulsory hijab? 
And I would say we have no reason to believe that. Uh, we have no no reason to believe that that might be the case, not least because of these, you know, sort of the extreme repression that's already happening on the streets. And we don't know the half of it because of the internet shutdown, but also because it's had the option of doing it in other spheres over the last 10 years. You know, part of my research is about solo female singing. And even though there's no law that forbids solo female vocals, um, these women at the very end were taken to court, charged with collaboration with foreign media and never given the right to sing, which would appear to be such a small issue. Um, but I think this is again about sort of this, you know, symbolic, um, uh, you know, upholding a certain um, image or ideology of the Islamic Republic, which at, at the you know at the end is very much tied to a certain representation of the female body. Yeah, I'll just chime in and echo. We don't know. Um, there's no blueprint, and that's that's a good thing, and also um, a nerve-wracking uh, thing. We're all holding our breath, and um, I think whatever happens. Um, we can be assured that there are lots of people who want a different kind of present and a different kind of future, one deeply, deeply informed by feminism and a lot of that feminism from the global South. So. Manija, final words? <laughs> okay. I feel like I talked so much. Um, I guess I've just been thinking about you know, whatever happens, how struggle transforms human beings and the ways that people find each other in the streets and the ways that they're transformed forever, right? By the experience of defying state power, of doing the so supposedly impossible, right? Um, um, of, of resisting incredible militarism and violence um, through, through unity and, and just thinking about all the thousands and thousands of people who are participating in this and how they're being um, forever transformed by this. And I, I think that that revolutionary experience and revolutionary um, consciousness um, will, you know, will, will remain and will continue, um, all, you know, no matter what the exact outcomes are that, that we can't possibly predict. What a great way to um, end this conversation. Well, thank you so much to everybody who tuned in. We had a sizable audience on all our platforms. Um, thank you to Arzu, Catherine, Furul, Nahid, and Manije so much for imparting your wisdom and your expertise on this really complicated um, unfolding issue. It's not easy to, to talk about the present. And if we had more time, we'd talk about how just how difficult it is to do these things when you're so invested personally also in what's happening, um, just the weight of all of that. It's, so thank you for taking the time in the midst of all of this to, to, um, to share your knowledge and expertise. Basam, I don't know if you have any final words as well. Yes, uh, I'd like to uh, thank everyone for this remarkable uh conversation we are i mean you might have seen me i've been trying to also manage with the mk uh some of the questions and some of the developments online and everyone has expressed their gratitude and uh were everyone was very excited to to be here and actually i don't think they wanted to end but we have to let you go because you have lives and uh i wanted to say before we break uh thanks to everyone and thanks to nagar for um basically you know moderating this uh, important discussion and thanks to mk for putting us online everywhere uh, before we break i just also want to say that we have tomorrow another um broadcast at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time with uh, Abdullah al Aryan, who teaches at Georgetown, Qatar. Uh, and he will be talking about a new book on football and politics and uh, state politics in the Middle East uh, at 12, again, uh, Eastern Time. And on Friday, we have uh, Maya Magdashi from Rutgers speaking on her uh, recent book, also Sextarianism. So I hope you can join us. Thanks to all our sponsors and to everyone watching this will be um also made available uh online uh as a separate video uh aside from the feed and uh, i hope we can speak with you soon under better circumstances though something tells me that those circumstances will take some time uh shukran uh and uh, have a wonderful day everyone
Thank you thank both. You. Uh, and thank you to everyone at Jadalia and Bassam and Negar and my co-panelists. Thank, 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 thank you. Thank you so much. So much. Beautiful. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum.